Hello, hello, hello. How's everybody doing? Good, good. Friday afternoon. Friday afternoon. I just spoke next door. I had to run over. I'm sorry for being a minute late. So let's get started. Come take a seat. All right, I'm talking about a topic here with Joy today uh, that I'm really excited about. I know Joy is as well. So democratizing machine learning on Kubernetes. And I don't know what you want, what you expect when you see that title, but we're going to talk about a journey that we've both had speaking from the heart um, and some different things that we've seen and then give you some best practices for what we've learned and how we propose we might move together as a community. So um, with that... I will hand it over to my lovely colleague, Joy, to introduce herself. Hi, uh, I'm Joy. I'm a uh, solution architect from the uh, Microsoft AI and Research Org. So I work with a team of data scientists and engineers on a daily basis. Uh, all, we're all uh, basically building models, training models uh, every single day, and obviously doing it in a very efficient way is super important. And that's where Kubernetes comes in, and, uh, and Lackey has been tremendously helpful. Thank you, Joy. Uh, Joy is absolutely a wonderful mind, and it's been a pleasure working with her for the last few months. But uh, I, I'm lucky. I'm an SRE over at Microsoft on Azure, and what I spend my day doing is helping folks with uh, Kubernetes. So Joy came to me several months ago, said, hey, can you help me? I hear Kubernetes is a great place for me to run machine learning workloads. Uh, she'd already taken a great look around and had a lot of things running, but we took a look together and what we found is what we're going to present and see, see what you all think. But I represent the SRE. So I build and maintain the infrastructure. I know how to build Kubernetes. I know how it should look, but I have no machine learning experience, right? What I would like to, to propose here that this is quite a common occurrence in this space. You have highly talented people at the infrastructure level um, who know how to build Kubernetes with their eyes shut and run it. And then you have a team of more than capable, wonderful data scientists chomping at the bit to use this infrastructure that you've built. The problem is that in the middle of that Venn, Venn diagram lives no one, right? So no, nobody lives there. Um, so what we're looking to do with this talk is, is start conversation around how do we get people in that middle, middle point so that the data scientists can get the best out of Kubernetes as a platform to run their machine learning deep uh, neural network workloads. Um, and me have confidence that I'm actually building the most efficient platform for them to utilize. Um, and this is where the uh, revelation is. I, I won't uh, chomp at the bit here. So what I'm seeing in the environment and, and working with Joy is the right tools are out there to run machine learning. The tooling is already there. And Kubernetes is the right platform but we have two distinct set of people that know two different knowledge pillars with no, nobody in the middle, right? So how do we actually start this conversation between infrastructure engineers who can lay down Kubernetes um, and the data scientists who want to do, uh, want to put Kubernetes to the test, which is what I was really excited about. So, you know, what we found taking a look at the documentation, it's, it's fairly, spotty out there when you take a look in the wild. Is anybody running uh, machine learning on Kubernetes workloads? Neural networks too or traditional? Okay. Okay. Fantastic. So you, you probably can sympathize with some of this. So the documentation is, is lacking in some places and when you do get a chance to take a look, everything's moving at the speed of light and typically it's out of date and or does not work and it's, it's several weeks old. Right, because Kubernetes is moving at a different plane to machine learning libraries and meeting them in the middle somewhere. So, you know, that was the challenge for me coming in with the infrastructure eye and Joy coming in with the ML eye looking at the same set of documentation, making sure how are we how do we make this a successful outcome. So thinking thinking about that, just digging down into what we do here, how do we lower the barrier to entry? So when we say democratizing, I think there's a whole world um, and I believe, working with Joy, that there's a whole world of folks chomping at the bit to get at this. They have neural networks to build and there's great minds out there to build them. But the, the barrier to entry is still very high for them to be able to get this knowledge out of their head and actually start putting it to the test. So how do we get some best practices and create some content out there so people don't stumble around as, as much as I did? I don't know if anybody else did, but um, to, to get there. So let's get started. But 
we're going to take you on a tour of deep learning because I think one of the things that trips me up at least is naming and nomenclature. A lot of these things are very deeply related, but they have different names in the ML world and different names in the infrastructure world. So Joy is going to give us a very great tour of how distributed deep learning works, and I think I'm going to speak for um, the infrastructure engineer. So I'll hand it back to Joy. OK, thank you, Lucky. Um, so before I uh, dive into uh, the nitty-gritty details about uh, doing uh, deep learning, especially distributed deep learning, which is actually much harder than a single node uh, deep learning training on Kubernetes. Um, I would like to just uh, to provide a quick context on uh, the typical uh, distributed training architecture uh, on multiple nodes. So there are mainly, in a deep learning space specifically, <laughs> Uh, there are mainly two ways of doing distributed uh, training if you want to scale out to multiple nodes. One uh, most popular way is actually uh, data parallelism. Um, basically, if you have multiple GPUs sitting across multiple nodes, uh, the way you do uh, deep, uh, distributed training for deep learning is basically you place a copy of your uh, deep neural net model within each every single GPU that you have. And then you feed a mini batch of the entire training data set, uh, one, one batch at a time, into each every single GPU. And each GPU basically just works on that mini batch of the data it's being fed to, and train the model one iteration at a time. And at the end of each iteration, basically it sends up the uh, the, uh, the delta, which we often call the gradient, uh, which is basically the delta of the parameters of the model that need to be updated at the end of that iteration. And it sends that delta, that gradient, uh, to a centralized uh, parameter server. And the parameter server basically talks to all GPUs, aggregate all of, all of those gradients uh, uh, that are sent across all those GPUs and do a central aggregation and then update the model uh, globally and then push down back the updated version of the model to each GPU again and then the whole, pros, uh, the, uh, whole iteration starts um, again. So this is the way uh, a typical data parallel, uh, parallelism uh, distributed training architecture works. Uh, the second way um, is called model uh, parallelism, and this happens when you have a, uh, a model that is too big to fit into one single GPU. And this normally happens when you have a big, large neural net that is doing some uh, natural language processing, big LSTM models, or um, those big uh, neural uh, machine translation models. Those are typically pretty big and cannot fit into one GPU. So you, in this case, you divide the model into K submodels, and each, G, each GPU just works on a submodel, and they all need to work with, uh, with each other to, in order to do uh, the global uh, model training. So this picture, I'm sure if you have used uh, TensorFlow distributed training, you must have seen this. Uh, architecture diagram a lot. Uh, this is a typical setting when you do TensorFlow uh, distributed training. You can have one or more uh, parameter ser servers sitting at the top, and then you have multiple GPUs across multiple nodes. One thing to call out uh, is uh, TensorFlow has done some uh, basic optimization in terms of the gradient uh, that are uh, being sent from each GPU. Uh, each worker node uh, that is doing the work uh, with multiple GPUs, they do do like a local aggregation first uh, to optimize the, the, the uh, network bandwidth before they send the per node level aggregated uh, variance up to the centralized parameter server. Fantastic, thank you, Joy. I think one of the things, just in hearing those three slides, that was a revelation to me as an engineer, knowing where the bits get pushed and crunched, and knowing I can already mentally map how that lays down on a Kubernetes. So what Joy actually did for me and open sourced it was just a bunch of steps to actually help me build out and map what she was doing. So she's created a very lightweight um, kind of in the weeds set up for us so that we can see a very uh, low level of how this thing hangs together without making it overly complex. So. 
bring any Kubernetes cluster on your provider of choice, this will work. But what we're doing here is with Kubernetes, we make sure that we have availability to the GPUs. So if you've ever used GPUs in Kubernetes, they are schedulable as a resource. You see them there. But just because they show up doesn't mean you have all your house in order on the nodes. Right, so you need the libraries to access the GPU hardware, whatever that be, a common, common one is uh, NVIDIA. So you need to make sure that your container runtimes actually have access to utilize that hardware. Right, so just because you can see that you have four GPUs doesn't mean your workloads actually have access to those GPUs. So there's a script inside that repo that will actually go and on your nodes you can run it and it'll make sure that your GPUs are in the right place and shape and then you can run this YAML file. So there's, uh, I'll, I'll quickly just pop over um, to this one. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. And we'll have, we'll have the links here at the end. But for me, joy putting this together and actually I could get in the weeds. I know lots of folks are like this. But knowing what a PS0 and a PS1 was and a worker 0 and a worker 1 in the context of what we just learned was in, uh, incredibly, uh, I was incredibly grateful that I had that knowledge because I could start to peel back how I could design an infrastructure for uh, what her workload was. So you can work through this at your own pace, but what it ends up is, is you have a parameter server and several workers, n number of workers. We run a Python script manually inside them all and describe where the parameter servers and the workers are, and this kicks off the process that um, Joy just detailed. But what you can see in there is you can see the number of batches we want to serve up and the different models, which is going to be great. Uh, Joy's going to take us into what we actually saw when we did a lot of benchmarking and testing. So this is available to you, um, and we'll have the links there at the end. Let me pop back over to the deck. And So finally, um, if you do a describe on your nodes, you will see GPUs if they're available. That, is, that feature is still under alpha, I believe, but you can do that. And most some uh, providers, GKE, have access, ACS, to GPU nodes. So you can run this up and start playing with it today. Now, I'm going to hand it back over to Joy, and she's going to take us through what we actually found together as we built this infrastructure. Uh, yeah, so uh, to, sh uh, to share with you some of the key learnings uh, we observed, uh, when we were doing a lot of the training uh, on Kubernetes, especially doing a lot of the uh, benchmarking tests, uh, tuning various different knobs and options and, uh, and uh, what we've learned uh, so far. So um, just to um, let you know uh, quickly, the training environment uh, we, we used uh, for the benchmark testing we did a couple of months ago, uh, I was using basically two worker nodes. Each worker has four. Uh, Tesla K80 GPUs, and uh, I was using one uh, just uh, CPU VM for my parameter server. Since parameter server, uh, as you have seen, basically its job is to do a lot of the, the gradient aggregation and update. It actually doesn't do the model training itself, so the parameter server does, re does not really need the GPU. So I was just using a, a CPU server for that, and uh, we were using the real uh, image or the whole ImageNet data set. And those benchmark scripts, so we did use the upstream benchmark scripts from TensorFlow yes, as well, right? Yes, so you can take of... this and run the same thing on your own test bed. Yes, correct. Uh, so uh, to, uh, before we go into the distributed training, uh, just to show you uh, what we observed on a single pod with multiple GPUs, as you can see, uh, with the chart uh, showing here, uh, you pretty much, you can get uh, a pretty good uh, linear scalability here. And I'm, I'm showing a ResNet here just for an example, but actually the same uh, pretty predictable linear scalability applies to a lot of different models we, we ran and tested. So uh, VGG16, Inception V3, Google Net, uh, different versions of ResNet, we've tried them a lot, we, we try them all, and they, they all scale from one GPU to two to four on a single node pretty nicely, and all the GPUs are fully saturated, which is actually good. And that means you're not wasting your GPU resources. And for the distributed uh, training testing, uh, just a, a quick uh, 
settings. Uh, so the, I was using just one parameter server and two workers, and I was doing the async uh, uh, gradient update uh, between, because uh, the communication between the parameter server and the worker node. Uh, can happen in a synchronous fashion or in an asynchronous fashion. Async uh, sometimes can help you, if you, especially if you have a slow network bandwidth. Uh, that means if you're using async, uh, the worker, each worker does not have to wait for the rest of the workers to all finish their batch of the data before uh, the worker can move on to the next batch. The communication, the synchronization, uh, uh, it, does, it can happen asynchronously. Uh, but sometimes using async can also hurt your speed to accuracy, meaning the parameter server sometimes can get a stale model coming from uh, a slower worker node which might be having some network issues. So um, the, the, the model you're training, the performance might go up and down a little bit uh, if you're using async. And, uh, and in this particular testing, the parameter server, each parameter server and each worker pod has their own dedicated host, so they're not competing for resources in this particular testing. And I'm not using a, any AffiniBand network, just pure Ethernet uh, or GPRC protocol. So here is uh, the distributed uh, testing um, results. As you can see, actually, uh, we have tested uh, different models here, and you can see different models actually have very different behaviors when you scale out. So it's not necessarily that you will always get the linear scalability. Uh, in this case, as you can see, uh, GoogleNet, uh, which is at the very left here, uh, it basically has pretty much the best uh, nearly uh, linear scalability here, where, whereas in the uh, Inception v3, the ResNet 50, they all, uh, they, they have uh, worse scalability. Uh, in this case, I was only getting about 1.6 speed up uh, when training on two nodes uh, versus one. And I, I think this was, when I first saw these results, this was a bit of a revelation because I was under the impression that you could just throw more hardware at the problem. But if these models aren't built to take advantage of that distributed hardware, you're just wasting your time. So a lot of effort on my part was wasted building larger clusters with bigger GPUs and putting more of them out there when the model couldn't actually saturate them. So you can see there that first diagram, GoogleNet actually linearly scales in a distributed fashion. But over to the right, there's a model there that's actually worse when you run it distributed. Yeah. Right? And, and some are 1.6. The average there, GoogleNet's the outlier there. The rest is not linearly scaling. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but me as an infrastructure engineer, give it more GPUs, give it more hardware. That We talk about that now, uh, causes other problems. So th this is kind of the knowledge gap that I was receiving and starting to build clusters a different way for these folks. So just to dive a little deeper on why uh, those models are uh, behaving very differently when you scale out. Basically, it all comes down to, uh, in one single sentence, uh, a, a critical characteristic uh, of your actual model architecture, which is the, the compute over communication ratio of the model. Basically, those two factors, how much, GP, how much GPU resources your model takes to get trained, and also how many parameters, your, how many layers your mo neural net model architecture has. It has a dictating factor on uh, how much network bandwidth it needs to con uh, consume. So the compute over communication ratio of the model really decides how well your model can scale. Uh, when you uh, try to scale out when you're doing the training. And as you can see, GoogleNet really has the highest ratio here. So that's why, uh, obviously, we, we saw uh, during our real training as well, it does scale pretty well, whereas uh, the other models, uh, they have lower ratio and they don't scale as, as well. And also, for me, I actually thought disk access was going to be the largest factor in this, that ratio, so compute to disk access. And talking to Joy, she informed me of something that I didn't know, so under the ML banner, right, which contains a lot of robots that do good and bad <laughs> things, um, there is traditional ML, things like Spark, which are uh, disk intensive. And then there's distributed deep learning, 
neural networks, yeah. which is the more modern, some more modern approaches, which are, are actually moving these data sets around the network. Crunch, move, crunch, move. So it's actually the move of that data after the model's been trained that is actually causes the, the whole model to slow down. How fast can I get the trained model, these layers, pushed around so everybody else knows about them? So again, a revelation to me, here we are with 40 gig NICs, right? So to actually move this around, otherwise the hardware. Also, I think, you know, in the parameter server model, as you scale out, more things get go to the parameter server. So your parameter server actually becomes your bottleneck because everybody's trying to shoot them 40 gigabits per second and he's only got a 40 gig gigabit per second NIC. So again, I thought you could throw more hardware at the problem and it actually made the problem worse, right? So let's, yeah. this is things we need to talk about and think about as we're building this infrastructure. Thanks, Joe. So uh, some other observations uh, that we wanted to call out uh, when we were doing the, uh, the training, in addition to the network bandwidth and obviously the, uh, the compute over uh, communication ratio of your actual model, uh, there were, uh, so as a, obviously, uh, a uh, Kubernetes admin, uh, when you're supporting your data scientists with your Kubernetes cluster, uh, they are doing their training on your uh, Kubernetes. Uh, the, the one big important thing to monitor is whether they are saturating your, uh, their GPUs or not, because if they, uh, their GPUs are basically sitting there idle, not getting saturated, then uh, you want to think twice before you uh, throw more hardware at uh, the problem. Um, and also another thing that I was uh, having to basically uh, try different options and wasn't really very intuitive for me to come up with an optimal design at the beginning was the, uh, the correct ratio between the, pri uh, the worker to the parameter servers. Uh, I was testing with two parameter servers, uh, with one parameter server, with two parameter servers sitting on the same host with the worker uh, on the same, uh, uh, with the same, uh, as the same host as the worker pods, or uh, should I be having the parameter server sitting separately on a, uh, on a separate host? Um, so those are all very uh, not so easy and intuitive to, to design at the beginning of your training. So we've shared a lot of pain points and a lot of uh, learnings. Uh, so how can we do better? So. Um, this is where I wanted to do uh, some quick call outs on some of the latest uh, technologies and frameworks that literally just came out about uh, uh, over the past two months. One thing uh, is uh, Harovat, uh, that is Uber's uh, recently open sourced uh, distributed uh, deep learning framework. For TensorFlow, uh, it is important to note that uh, it is not replacing TensorFlow or just yet another fork of TensorFlow. It is actually a standalone Python package that works on top of TensorFlow. So you don't have to worry about uh, uh, getting distracted or getting detached from the mainstream TensorFlow. Uh, this is just another uh, nice standalone package that works with uh, TensorFlow. And it solves a lot of the uh, the network bottleneck issues and also uh, the hard decision uh, on uh, what's the correct ratio between your parameter server and worker. It solves a lot of those problems uh, by using um, the ring or reduce algorithms uh, so that all of those workers, instead of uh, syncing and, and sending their uh, parameters, those gradients to a centralized parameter server, they can all just talk directly among each other. So n now with Harawalt, you don't need even to uh, specify uh, how many parameters uh, servers you need anymore. There is no parameter server. All the workers can just talk directly with each other among themselves using this ring or reduce algorithm that is highly efficient uh, uh, at uh, cross node, intra node, or internal. GPU communication. And uh, it is using this Nico and Nico 2 library from NVIDIA. Nico 1 is for internal GPU communication. Inter, uh, Nico 2 is for internal uh, GPU communication. And they all use uh, ring or reduce uh, to talk to each other directly. 
And also, um, uh, it, it basically, uh, because all the workers now uh, can talk directly to each other uh, from the network bandwidth uh, perspective, you also uh, basically avoid a lot of the, uh, the network uh, bandwidth bottleneck uh, that we were running into uh, earlier. So as you can see from the chart here, uh, if you're running Horowald on top of TensorFlow, you get a much better, a much more predictable uh, linear scalability when you scale out. And it doesn't ma matter what model, uh, what your specific model architecture is anymore. As you can see, whether you're using Inception v3, ResNet, or VGG16, uh, your model can all pretty much scale pretty nicely. And in this way, uh, since you get better predictability of the scalability, you then can design in a much easier way how exactly how many workers you need, how many GPUs you need, instead of guessing and testing. And another thing is this uh, deep gradient in, uh, compression uh, technology. There's a pa this is a paper that literally just came out about two weeks ago. It also directly uh, targets on addressing the, uh, the, the huge uh, network communication bandwidth issue here when you're do doing um, deep learning training uh, across multiple nodes. Basically, uh, it turned out that 99.9% .9 of the gradients exchange could be too actually tiny to be uh, significant, significant enough to be transferred in the first place. So it does a lot of uh, compression technique without losing the accuracy. Uh, if you're interested in this, uh, check out this uh, paper. It's actually, uh, it can really democratize distributed training over commodity, just one gigabit ethernet. Yeah, I, I, I like the, the smaller next too, and I think even the, the Google Pixel 2 ships with the TPU. So they're obviously doing something very similar yeah. as well. Now you can actually process these models and not have to have large bandwidths between them. Thanks, Joy. So I think in the spirit, the spirit of making this easier, one of the things that the, the Microsoft Research, uh, ML Research Lab did was actually uh, create an open source repo where you can bring your own Kubernetes cluster and install just a couple of pods and have a lightweight framework. And Joy's just gonna take us through uh, how you could run these models yourself in that workspace. Um, can you do that? Yeah. Yep, there we go. So this is a... Uh basically an open source toolkit uh, we just released about uh, uh, a few months ago. It's from Microsoft Research. This is the deep learning workspace uh, that are uh, being used by our researchers, data scientists uh, from Microsoft Research on a daily basis when they do uh, a lot of uh, deep learning training. And it is backed by Kubernetes and you can install this on-prem on any cloud providers. So uh, it is uh, integrated with uh, uh, Active Directory, so I can just quickly log in there. And obviously, a typical data scientist, a typical data scientist wouldn't really know anything about Kubernetes, and all they need to have is just access to this very intuitive, simple to use uh, GUI. Uh, so um, if I, for example, if I want to just spin up a uh, a Jupyter Notebook, I can go and select a, a TensorFlow IPython uh, CPU template and uh, I can just click on the Submit button and I'll get a Jupyter Notebook really quickly. And, but what I really want to show you now is uh, how I can do a, a distributed TensorFlow training just from this simple GUI uh, interface. So I can now just basically select the job type to be a distributed training and I can give it a job name. I can call it Joy TF Test 9. And in this case, for example, uh, I can have just one parameter server and two workers, and each worker should have just one GPU. And uh, for the Docker version, I want to use, say, for example, TensorFlow 1.2. And uh, in the training command line, I can just simply uh, tell it the, this is the Python, uh, obviously the Python, my, type, my TensorFlow Python script here. So uh, I can enable TensorBoard. So obviously uh, people love TensorBoard for debugging purposes. So when you're doing the training, often you can just say enable TensorBoard and you will get an endpoint. End 
and you can just quickly specify a model path for saving your uh, model checkpoint. And uh, then you just click on submit. And now, you, as you can see, a, a job, some jobs are being queued, and uh, they will get scheduled uh, very shortly. And uh, while we are waiting for the jobs to get scheduled, uh, I can show you a previous uh, notebook, uh, Jupyter Notebook job that I uh, spin up. So this is a Jupyter Notebook uh, job that I had opened. Uh, oh, this is. So here, uh, I was given an endpoint, and uh, by just simply clicking uh, at the endpoint, I, uh, there's my Jupyter Notebook. <coughs> And then back to my uh, uh, previous uh, distributed uh, training job, as you can see, the job is already running. So if I cl click into uh, the job output, you can see actually there's a real-time training going on here. I specified uh, 5,000 steps uh, across two worker nodes, and you can see there are, like, uh, there are two workers each working on uh, some steps here. So, um, and then uh, just quickly, if I want to uh, see my tensor board, I can just go into um, my tensor board. Endpoint. Um, and uh, so there's my tensor board. That is literally the graph uh, for my uh, model that I specified in my uh, script. So uh, back to the slide. So just uh, very quickly, two quick things I want to call out. Um, there is a, a free flow CNI plugin that comes with the deep learning workspace we've just shown you. Uh, and the plugin is from Microsoft Research. Uh, it basically uh, it automatically uh, leverage uh, shared memory if you happen to have pods uh, that are sitting on the same host. And also, if you do have RDMA uh, network, whether it's Rocky or Infiniband, it automatically detects uh, that you have RDMA network, and it will use the RDMA network uh, automatically, uh, and it's completely transparent to your pods and your apps. Uh, so it's mainly uh, because this is super critical when you're doing deep learning workloads on Kubernetes. Network bandwidth, network communication speed is always super important, and this is why uh, we use the FreeFlow CNI plugin ourselves a lot to help with the, the network performance. And also, we are contributing back to the Kubernetes communi community uh, by we're going to be uh, contributing a, a, a GPU uh, resource scheduler, and that is uh, from Sanjeev from our Microsoft research team as well. So with that scheduler as a, a custom plugin that you can plug into your Kubernetes cluster, uh, your data scientists can uh, or your DevOps can specify a pod, not only with just how many GPUs you need for the pod, but also how many GPUs with how much memory and also how many GPUs with, uh, uh, that are inter interconnected uh, through NVLink. Those are all very important when you're running uh, deep learning uh, GPU-related uh, workloads on Kubernetes. Thanks, Joy. And just to, just to round up, there's a bunch of other resources that we placed on here. There's a lot of community engagement already going on. I know that the folks at Google announced Kubeflow a couple of days, and there'll be folks rallying around that, so maybe go take a look at that as well. Um, but everything up here today, but what we're hoping for is that we can all work together and build a community around making ML workloads run great on Kubernetes and get some uh, knowledge gaps that exist here today between me knowing ML and the data scientist knowing Kubernetes. Um, feel free to engage with both Joy and myself. We, we do this day in and day out via Twitter or you, you can find us somewhere or other or we're taking questions. But thank you very much for your time. Thank you.